Yeah. All right. So last last week we spoke about Reb Shem Bar Yochai, and we spoke about the significance of Reb Shem Bar Yochai and what he represented and how he represented through the Zohar the ability to bring um, uh, the mystical, the spiritual into the physical world, and then use that to be able to uplift the physical world. That was the lesson he got from the elderly gentleman holding his hadassim before Shabbos. And you have to excuse me, my allergies are really acting up today. So I might be sneezing a few times during class. Um, so that was what we learned about Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai, whose yort site is tonight. Lag Baomer, Habal Lein Lutova, whose yort site is tonight. Um, and uh, we said that Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai's Rebbe was Rabbi Kiva. Uh, and um, uh, there was a question that a few people asked me. Um, uh, we, we said we were going to come back to it, which was that what was it about Rabbi Kiva that gave him the ability to disseminate this, uh, you know, the, the Torah Shabbat Peh, this, all those traditions onto Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai to be able to build Torah the way that Rabbi Kiva was able to accomplish. We mentioned the Gemara in Masech the Chagiga and Daf Yedalit, that Rabbi Akiva was the only one of the Chachamim who went into the Pardes, which we said was going into the depths of Torah and uh, Torah's mysticism. Um, uh, and he was the only one that was able to, to do that and come out not just unscathed, but he came out, um, uh, um, as the Gemara says, he was Nichnas, Bishalom v'yatsa b'shalom. He went in whole and he came out whole. That it only made him um, uh, even greater than he had went in. He became he came out um, uh, completely shalom. So uh, shalom. So that is uh, so so that was Rabbi Kiva. What what made Rabbi Kiva who uh, who he was? Because we know that Rabbi Kiva came from uh, very humble beginnings, very humble beginnings. Like the Gemara tells us in Masech the Ksubis on Daf Samach. Um, uh, where the Gemara tells us the following. Ksubis. Ksubis Samach Beis Amud Beis. Where the Gemara tells us Tells the I'm just looking for the place in the Gemara. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm looking in the wrong place. That's why I can't find it. It's the Gemara in Psachim. I'm in Bays. I'm in Bays. I'm sorry. The Gemara says the following Tanya. <laughs> Uh, the Gemara says, Tanya, Amar Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said, Kishahayiti Ama Aretz, that when I was in Ignoramus, before I became a Torah scholar, Amarti, I said, Imyitainli Talmud Chacham, if someone were to show me a Torah scholar, the Achshenu Kechamor, I would bite him like a donkey. That's what Rabbi Akiva said, I would bite him like a donkey. Amrlo Talmidov, his students said to him, right? Rabbi Kiva is telling his students about, you know, his past, his humble beginnings. You know, he wasn't always the Rabbi Kiva that's standing in front of you, right? So the students say back to him, well, why like a donkey? Amr Kikalev, what about like a dog? Right, why like a donkey? Amr uh, Lahen, so Rabbi Kiva responds to them and says, Zed no sheikh v'shober etzem, Zed no sheikh v'ena shober etzem. When a dog bites, it, it nicks. It does not, uh, it doesn't break bones. When a donkey bites, it could break a bone. That's why I would bite them like that. To the point I'd break their bones. Mm -hmm. That's the way Rabbi Kiva felt about Tamir Chachamim when he was, uh, when he was, you know, an ignoramus before he became the great Rabbi Kiva. Uh -oh. But he's saying how intensely, how intensely he hated Tamir Chachamim. The Gemara, so the Tosos in Ksuba San Samach Beis, so Tosos quotes this Gemara and he says, what did Rabbi Kiva hate so much about Tamir Chachamim? Amr Rabbi Kiva, because Hayiti Am Haaretz Hayiti Omer Mi Tain Li Tamir Chacham Veachshen Ukechamor. That Rabbi Kiva said that I hated Tamir Chachamim. I would bite them like a donkey. Mashma, what that means? 
Delohave male male ika le meimar. The hasam by the Rebbe Kivo saying that lav mishum shehi sone tamid chachamim. It's not that Rebbe Kiva hated the concept of being a Torah scholar. It's not that he hated Torah. He hated the concept of being a Torah scholar. You know what he hated about the Torah scholars from that he knew when he was an ignoramus? It was that he hated al mishum shehi sover she misgayin al ame ahaaretz that he felt that they were very pompous when dealing with people who, who uh, were less knowledgeable than them. That uh, those that were Hamid uh, HaChachamim, the Hamid HaChachamim I know from when I was an Amaretz, they were, they did not have good midos. Um, and they, uh, they, they, were, they, they, they were up on their high horse. They were, they were pompous in the way that they, uh, they dealt with, with regular people. But nevertheless, you see the Rebbe Akiva did not come from, uh, you know, he wasn't born Rabbi Kiva. Like uh, my Rebbe says, uh, one of my Rebbeim, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Parnas, who's my Rebbe in high school, he would say to us, he'd say that, uh, he'd say that, uh, do you think that uh, a Rabbi Shmuel Birnbaum, who was his Rosh Yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva of Mir Yeshiva in Brooklyn, he'd say Rabbi Shmuel Birnbaum um, uh, didn't come out of the womb knowing Aramaic and knowing Shas. You have to, that, that, uh, you have to work at it. Rabbi Kiva, you know, I, clearly did not. He was not, the Rebbe Kiva that we remember, he was, uh, or that we learned from, he was, was in Ignoramus and someone that even had some sort of a disdain towards the models of being Talmud HaChachamim. But it says that he, it wasn't the, the Torah that he objected to, it was the Talmud It was the Talmud HaChachamim you rejected. Then he wasn't a complete Ignoramus if he knew some Torah. Or Who it, said he didn't know any Torah? In fact, we're going to see we're going to see later in Avoster of Nasan that in Avoster of Nasan says Rabbi Kiva didn't even know the Aleph base. He didn't know anything. He didn't hate the concept of Torah. It's not that he hated concept, it. It, it was it not. wasn't the con. It was the way that it was manifesting itself. It was the, ma- the way it was manifesting itself in those people that he hated. Yeah. So now, what what's so incredible, Rabbi Akiva, is that despite the fact that that's the way he started, how did he end up? Well, number one, we know he ended up as the only one of the great scholars of the Chachamim that was able to go to the depths of to Pardes, not the place, the concept, and come out, un, not just unscathed, but the Shalom, as the Gemara says, completely whole. Um, but more than that, we find the Gemara Minachos, it seems to indicate that Rabbi Kiva was perhaps even a greater Torah scholar than Moshe Rabbeinu himself. How can you even say such a thing? In fact, the Rambam writes that um, uh, that part of the thirteen principles of uh, uh, fundamentals of Judaism says the Rambam is the belief that Moshe Rabbeinu is the great, greatest prophet that has ever was and ever will be. And if you don't believe that, that makes you an apikaros. It makes you a non-believer. And here we have a Gemara saying that Rabbi Akiva was even a greater Torah scholar than perhaps Moshe Rabbeinu was. What does the Gemara say? The Gemara says the following. When Moshe Rabbeinu went up on Har Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, when he went up on um, uh, when he went up on Har Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, Matzula Hakadosh Baruch Hu Shiyoshe V'Kosher Kisrim Laosios. He found God writing, whatever that means, that God was inscribing the crowns on top of the letters in the Torah. You look at the letters of the Torah, some of the letters have a, a crown at the top of, of the letters. So mo, the God was inscribing the crowns on top of, on top of the letters of the, in, inside, in, in the Torah. Amr Lafan of Rabbanu Shalom, Moshe says, Master of the Universe, me ma'akev al yadcha, me ma'akev al yadcha, that uh, um, uh, um, um, M- Moshe says to uh, Moshe says to God that he says, uh, "Who's going to know what this means?" Who's going to know what this means? I don't know what this means. I don't know what those the crowns are supposed to indicate. What what the meaning behind each of them are? So who is going to be able to understand this? Like, what are you? As if to say, why are you writing it? If if I can't understand it, who's going to be able to understand it? So says God, Amr lo Adam Echad Yesh. 
there is one person, that's going to live in a long time from now. The Akiva ben Yosef Shemo, his name is Akiva ben Yosef. Who's Akiva ben Yosef? That's Rabbi Akiva. Yosef, his father, was a convert, by the way. Um, uh, so Akiva ben Yosef Shemo, this fellow Rabbi Akiva, that he's going to be able to interpret every single nuance that's contained within the Torah, even these crowns that are on top of the, on top of the letters inside the Torah. Rabbi Kiva is going to be able to understand all this. Says, says Moshe Rabbeinu, Amar lefanav, shalom, li. Can you show him to me? I really would love to see him. So what do they do? They go into uh, um, uh, they go into God's uh, time machine, and uh, and uh, God shows him Rabbi Kiva. Amra lo, chazor laachorach, go turn around, go to the back. Halach v'yashav v'shof v'shof shmona shuros. He went to sit in the eighth row in the back of the room that Rabbi Kiva was teaching in. V'lo hayodea ma hein. And he's listening to the shear from Rabbi Kiva. He has no clue what he's talking about. Meaning, mm-hmm. meaning Moshe is having a hard time talking about Rabbi Kiva. I'll yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, that that uh, he's having a, he's having a, um, um, uh, Moshe is having trouble understanding the shear, the class that Rabbi Kiva is giving. <laughs> it's amazing. It's unbelievable, Gemara. Omrim Tashash Kocho. Um. Uh, they got to some difficult topic. Uh, so they come to something that's a very difficult topic. And uh, they ask, the, the student asks, asks Rabbi Akiva, one of the students in the room, right? Moshe Rabbeinu is sitting there in the back, right? Like the, all those classic scenes, you, like in, in the movies where, you know, uh, you know, let me show you what your life would have been like, right? And, right? So he's sitting in the back, right? No one knows that Moshe Rabbeinu is sitting there with God. And uh, Rabbi Kiva's teaching. So one of the students raises his hand. He's not understanding what the source is for what Rabbi for what Rabbi Kiva's teaching about the crowns that are on top of the letters. And what is what is Rabbi Kiva's response? Amr lahen halacha lemoshe misinai. I receive this as tradition straight from Har from Har Sinai from Moshe Rabbeinu. Now that in of itself is very difficult to understand. Well, then how is it that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't understand it if if this is something that Rabbi Kiva's teaching based off of a tradition that goes back to Har Sinai? So it's not really the topic of what we're discussing, but it's important to understand, especially as we're getting closer to Shavuos, where what that means is that everything we received at Harsinai was not just information, but we received principles on how to understand the Torah. So there potentially could be a tradition that Rabbi Kiva is applying to the understanding of the crowns on top of the letters of the Torah, that Moshe Rabbeinu himself didn't make that connection, even though he taught the principle at Har Sinai that was passed down to Rabbi Kiva, who figured out how to apply it. So, so this is all happening in the room. Um, uh, so, so now Moshe Rabbeinu turns to God and says, Amr Lefan of Rabbanu Shalom, he says, Master of the universe, Yeshra Adam Kazeh, that you have this Rabbi Akiva, who's clearly seems to be the basic reading of the Amari, seems to be greater than me. So then why are you why are you giving the Torah through my hand? Right? Why am I the one who's going to be teaching the Torah to Kali Yisrael? It should be Rabbi Akiva. Give have Rabbi Akiva be the one to give to give the Torah, not me. By the way, this is not the first time that Moshe Rabbeinu tries passing the <laughs> passing the puck. Um, uh, not at all. Um, uh, and so what does God say to him? Similar to uh, what he says to him in the Torah. Um, Amr lo, shtok. That, quiet. Like, that's not up, those decisions aren't up to you. Kach ala lefanai. This is, I think, is the right thing, is the right thing to do. What, do we, what comes out from this Gemara? What comes out from this Gemara is Rabbi Kiva. Even though he had those humble beginnings, he became someone potentially even greater than Moshe Rabbein. We're talking about Torah knowledge potentially even greater than the Moshe Rabbein. So how does one make that kind of a 180 shift, right? How do you become, how do you go from someone who hated Torah scholars, right? Um, uh, not the Torah, but the scholars that the Torah was contained within. How, someone who hated Torah scholars, who the, the Pirkei de Rabbi Nassan tells us that, uh, uh, the Abbas de Rabbi Nassan rather, the Abbas de Rabbi Nassan in the sixth chapter tells us that Rabbi Kiva didn't even know Aleph Bey's, 
and uh, to the point that he becomes even greater than Moshe Rabbeinu in terms of Torah, Torah knowledge. How does that, how does that happen? So there's a, a Tosos and Masech Subas that um, uh, helps us understand how Rabbi Kiva did this. And really the Tosos is coming to tell us that this is not exclusive to Rabbi Kiva. Anyone can do exactly the same. That anyone can become as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. By the way, there's a Rambam that says exactly like that. There's a Rambam that says that anybody can become as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. Anybody. It is the, the, it's the, right in the sixth chapter of the laws of Tshuva. The Rambam says that everyone has Bechira Chavshis. We all have free will. And we can choose, if we so desire, to be even greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. But okay. not as great as Rabbi Akiva? No, but, but Rabbi Kiva became greater than Moshe Rabbeinu in Torah, in Torah knowledge, right? From an overall character in, in, the, in Tanakh, right? In, in, our, in, in our traditions, Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, reigns supreme, right? Is the greatest prophet that ever was and ever will be. Um, but in terms of reaching their potential, right? Aaron, who was not as great of a prophet as Moshe Rabbeinu, also reached his full potential, which is why Rashi says that he was just, quote unquote, as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. Rabbi Kiva also, it seems like from this Gemara, was, quote unquote, as great. But in Torah knowledge, perhaps even surpassed Moshe Rabbeinu. So he made this 180, says Tosos, anyone can make that 180. And it gives us, uh, it, it gives us a glimpse into how, Mo, how Moshe Rabbeinu did it. But in order to appreciate Tosos, we have to take a, get a step back and, and give some context to uh, Rabbi Akiva's life, uh, life story. Okay, so what happened to Rabbi Kiva? Rabbi Kiva, as we mentioned before, was born to uh, um, uh, um, parents who were converts. I don't know whether or not his mother was a convert, but his father was a convert, Yosef. Um, uh, he, um, he did not grow up with uh, much of a religious upbringing and background. He was uh, Torah observant, but he did not know um, uh, much Torah. In fact, the, as we mentioned before, the Abbasur of says he didn't even know didn't even know the olive phase. Um, he ended up meeting a girl whose name was Rachel. Her name was Rachel. Now, who was Rachel? She came from the home of Kalba Savu. I, I don't know Kalba Savu's name. Um, I, 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 I don't remember whether or not the, um, uh, the Gemara actually tells us his name, but why was he called Kalba Savu? So Kalba Savu was the wealthiest man in Jerusalem. And he was called Kalba Savua because Kalba means dog. Savua means satiate, um, satiate. That hungry people would come to him. People that are, are hungry, like the way that you see a, a ravenous dog eat something that they just, you know, they gobble it up. That people would come to him that hungry and he would make them Savua. He would make them satiated. He was a major Baal Chesed, a philanthropist. He was the most wealthiest and, the, and one of the biggest Baal Chesed in Yerushalayim. This is Kalba Sabu and his, his daughter, Rachel. Um, uh, Rachel meets Akiva, who was just a, a, a farmer at the time, and uh, wants to marry him. Kalba Sabu is not happy with this. Kalba Sabu says that, I mean, you can only imagine, right? My daughter who's a Tzadikas, the daughter of the, 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 the wealthiest, biggest Baal Chesed in Yerushalayim, can have any any bachelor she wants. This farm boy who doesn't know anything, that's the shit you want, right? I mean, you could only imagine the fights that took place in the house mm -hmm. to the point that, the point that um, Kalba Sabua says to Rachel and, you know, and, and um, Akiva at the time, says to, says to them that if you move ahead and get married, I'm cutting you off completely. Cutting you off 100%. You cannot receive any um, uh, benefit from me, and I'm not going to be getting any benefit from you. And that is a binding. Um, uh, that that is a, that is a binding oath, a binding vow. It's a it's, um, uh, concept of a neder, right? If someone takes a a, a neder that the, this bowl of M and M's is to me like hectish, that just like sacrosanct meat, I'm not allowed to eat. Belongs to the base on Megdash. So and so too, I'm not going to be able to eat these M and M's. If I eat those M and M's, it's like I ate a cheeseburger. It's it is it is a prohibition from the Torah that I could receive lashes for. Kalba Savua made a real nether over here. He made a real oath. He said that he, we are cutting each other off if you move forward with this. They end up getting married. And because of that, they, uh, um, uh, Akiva lost the dowry. And uh, they, they could not be supported anymore from her father. He, Akiva, was just a lowly farmer. 
They could barely afford anything. They were sleeping essentially like on the streets. They made beds using hay and were, they were sleeping. And um, they would have dreams of, 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 uh, of, of one day, you know, living a, a, a life of luxury that Gamar tells a story that Akiva um, uh, had, had scraped up enough money to buy for his wife um, a, a, a Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, an emblem of uh, uh, depicting uh, Jerusalem in gold, uh, they, they, they would dream together, but it was, they were these, you know, far off dreams. And then one day, um, uh, whatever was the, the, the motivating factor, um, one day, uh, Rachel pushes Akiva, I want you to go learn in yeshiva. I want you to go learn in yeshiva. Why? Because Rachel saw the potential in Rabbi Kiva. Saw the potential in him. That's why they ultimately want to get married. Because Rachel saw the potential in him. It wasn't for his wealth. It wasn't for his good looks. It wasn't. It was not because he was a great Torah scholar. She saw potential in Rabbi Kiva. Sends him off to yeshiva. He goes to yeshiva for twelve years. Now, mind you, he was the only breadwinner. Was barely making en enough as it was. Rachel was not allowed to get anything from her father. Not only because he didn't want to, but because there was a hala there was a halachic. Um, uh, um, uh, um, prohibition that was preventing any sort of support from her parents. She was living in complete poverty. 12 years later, Rabbi Kiva comes back from Yeshiva. He's about to walk inside the house and uh, overhears through the door that Rachel is visiting with one of her friends. And uh, the, one of the friends is telling her like, you know, that I can't believe that you're allowing this to go on. And this is like, this is like, this is horrible. You're living here in poverty. Your husband is out learning in yeshiva. This is horrible that, uh, that you, this is the situation you're in. Rachel says she completely um, uh, uh, despised this sentiment and says to the friend, says that if he came back right now, I'd send him away for another 12 years. So Bikiva hears that through the door. He doesn't even knock on the door, turns right around and goes back to yeshiva for another 12 years. Comes back 24 years later. Now, now he's coming back as the Gadol Hador. Now he's coming back as- father ever was he still alive? Did he did he know that? Did he ever know that? Oh, so we're gonna get to that in just a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so he comes back now, 24 years later. He is Rabbi Kiva. He's about 65 years old now at the time. He is the great Rabbi Akiva. Um, the Gadol Hador, he comes back with 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 a whole parade of people escorting him. Um uh, they in Yerushalayim, they have a whole big um Asifa, a whole big gathering set up to welcome the Gadol Hador to town, right? Imagine Chaim Knievsky's that's how came to La Jolla, right? Like what we did when Rosh Hashanah came, right? It was a whole major, right? This is Rabbi Akiva we're talking about, right? Alachas Kam Kama, the whole Yerushalayim, everyone's so excited about Re greeting Rabbi Akiva. So um, uh, they're having this big asifa, and of course, um, uh, Rabbi Akiva sends for his wife to come, and uh, um, uh, she comes, and 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 they they reunite, and then of course, who is to come to this great gathering? Kabbal Savul. Why? Kabbal Savua was the balabas. He was he was the major donor, right? Of course, they, they, of course, he's the he's the biggest bal chesed in Yerushalayim. Of course, he's going to come to the party. Of course, he has um, a ticket right in to see the galador. He goes in front of the galador. He doesn't know who he's standing in front of, and uh, um, uh, Rabbi Kiva says, "I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you to leave the the venue. I'm going to ask you to leave the sasifa." He says, "Why?" He says, you, you must not remember who I am. I'm your son-in-law, Akiva ben Yosef, married to your daughter, Rachel. So Kabbal Savua, at this point, says, um, uh, um, uh, says, machali, 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 please forgive me. Rabbi Kiva is mater, his nether. He absolves, absolves his, um, his oath using hataris nadarim and says, uh, okay, and then they come, they rejoin, and uh, beautiful, happy ending to, to the story. Okay, beautiful. Now that is an amazing story. I, I, I am surprised that Disney has yet to um, uh, buy the rights um, uh, for for such a, for such a story. But this, he was gone all the time. Did they they never had a family then. Rocco and Akiva. So so Rabbi Kiva had a previous wife. I don't know if he had any students from um, from Rachel, from any any sons from Rachel, any any um, children. Um, he had a son from his previous marriage. Um, she unfortunately passed away, his first wife. Um, he had a son, Yoshua. Yoshua is known as Yoshua ben Karcha. That's the Yoshua ben Karcha we find in the Mishnah sometimes. Um, 
why is he not called Yeshua ben Akiva? Yeshua ben Karcha, Karcha means the bald one. Rabbi Kiva had a, a nickname, a Baldi. Um, uh, that, uh, so Yeshua ben Karcha, the bald one. So, um, uh, so this, is, this is the story. Now, that's a beautiful story, except it seems to be halachically inaccurate. Why is it halachically inaccurate? Remember, we're going back now to the laws of Nadar, taking oaths. Kaabas of Uwa took an oath against Akiva and Rachel. Why did he take the oath? Took the oath because Rabbi Kiva was a, a nachschlepper and uh, he was a, uh, just a farm boy, not good enough for my daughter, and therefore I'm cutting you off completely. In order for a neder to be absolved in Bezdin, um, uh, like what we do on, you know, Arab Rosh Hashanah, we want to um, uh, uh, get rid of all of our, our oaths and our vows. So in order for that to happen, there's a few conditions that need to be met, but one of the conditions that needs to be met is that the regret that one has over the nether they took um, is regretting the fact that they took the nether despite the fact that there are circumstances that are now that they're confronting that they don't want to have to keep the nether, right? Like this case with Kaaba Savua. But the only types of scenarios that one um, that are, are, are good enough reasons to absolve a neder is something you could have thought of, not an impossibility. If it's an impossibility, so then that's not a good enough reason. So uh, 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 here's a, a strange uh, idea that may or may not be accurate, but it's, it's good enough to make the point, which is let's say somebody five years ago made a, a, uh, a vow that uh, I don't want to get any benefit from Zoom. Okay, I don't want to get any benefit from Zoom, video conference. I don't like it. I want to just be able to talk on the phone or meet with people in person, and then right? And then COVID hits. Mm -hmm. Now, who in their right mind, when they made that vow about Zoom, could have ever thought that there would be a pandemic that would force people to have to use Zoom to adapt um, uh, or, or, or you're not going to be able to make it through the pandemic, right? You have to be able to, to adapt in such a way. So, um, uh, um, so in that scenario, that may be a ned there that was taken. And the only reason you want to absolve it is due to an impossible scenario that um, you would have never thought of when you made the oath, says the Gemara in Nadarm on Samoth Dalid. That is not a legitimate excuse to resolve the oath. It's only things that you could have thought of. Why the Gemara comes to that conclusion is not our topic right now. Only things you could have thought of at the time you took the ned there are good enough reasons to absolve the net. Sounds like it should be the opposite. Yeah, like You'd the think so. Way. You'd think so. But the reason, the, re the bottom line reason is because, is because we want to make sure when you take a, a net there, you mean it, right? So, it, so I, 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 I mean it. I've gone through all the scenarios and, I, and, and I, I really mean it. Later, I realized I was wrong and I regret it. You can't regret something you would have never thought of. I regret it because uh, I shouldn't have done it. I realize now I shouldn't have done it. At the time, I would have never thought of doing such a thing. So how could I say I wouldn't have done it? I probably still would have done it because I would have never thought of this scenario, right? It's being able to say, I wouldn't have done it. You're only able to say something like that if it's a situation that you, you thought may end up happening and you didn't think you would regret it. Now you are regretting it. So you're able to resolve your death, uh, uh, absolve your own. <laughs> So this is, this is the halacha. So now going back to Kalba Savua. Kalba Savua, he, uh, he, he's sitting in front of Rabbi Akiva. He made this oath, why? Because Rabbi Akiva was not good enough. For he only wanted his daughter to marry a Torah scholar. And Rabbi Akiva at the time was, well, he didn't even know Aleph days, right? And now look at it. Now he's Rabbi Akiva. So, so that is, should, it's an impossibility, right? So says Tosos, the premise of our question is absolutely incorrect. Tosos writes, Yeshlomar, the Hacha lo Chashiv Nolad. Here, this is not called an impossibility. Kivan Shahalach Lebe Rav, because Rabbi Kiva went to Yeshiva, the Derechu, because that is the way things work. The Holech Lil Mode, that when one goes to learn, Shinase Adam Gadol, that they become a Gadol, they become a great person. They could be cut. They, it's, it's not an impossibility. It's the opposite. Even if someone just goes to yeshiva, 
in all likelihood, they're going to end up like Rabbi Akiva. That's what Tosa says. And therefore, Kabbalah Zavua didn't think his son-in-law, his future son-in-law, was never going to learn ever. He just didn't think he would end up being the Gadol Hador, right? He didn't think he was good enough for his daughter. Right now, you're not good enough. But it's not an impossibility. It's not like I think you're never going to go to learn ever. And being that you even just go to learn for a little bit, you're going to end up becoming a Tamil Chacham. Now, that's a very nice Tosos. But, I mean, speaking from personal experience, I learned in Yeshiva for um, a, a number of years, for, you know, 12 years in Yeshiva. Uh, and before that, Yeshiva, uh, Yeshiva High School. And before that, Hebrew Day School. And uh, I'm no Rabbi Kiva. I'm not even close to Rabbi Kiva. I'm Rabbi Ki- I'm, I'm, I don't even hold up to one of Rabbi Kiva's toenails. I'm nothing. So, so I, I, so I, I tried, I went to yeshiva and I didn't end up like Rabbi Kiva. So then how does Tosos hold up? How did Rabbi Kiva actually do this? How did he become Rabbi Kiva? He went to yeshiva. Okay. So many people will go to yeshiva, but they don't end up becoming like Rabbi Kiva. So, so I think that Rabbi Kiva possessed a characteristic that um, uh, really anyone can end up possessing, but Rabbi Kiva was a master in a certain characteristic that, um, really was the impetus for him to be able to become, become Rabbi Kiva. Of course, it had to begin by him going to yeshiva. But how is it that when he went to yeshiva, he turned out as Rabbi Kiva, but not everyone does that? Because I think Rabbi Kiva possessed a certain characteristic that was very unique in this regard. <laughs> Excuse me. What? So that's number one. <laughs> that's number one. Uh, number two, Rachel actually. seems to have the same characteristic as Rabbi Kiva, because I was going to say that um, uh, Rabbi Kiva sees the, um, uh, sees the potential in the, um, uh, in the situations that are in front of him. He, he sees the situation beyond just the, the, the isolated scenario that it is, but he sees the, the potential that's contained within it. Okay, for, for example, the story in Avostar of Nasim. The story that, about how we know Rabbi Kiva didn't even know the Aleph base is because the Brisa tells us in the Avostar of Nasim that Rabbi Kiva was sitting by the lake, sitting by a river or something, and uh, he sees there's a, a, a rock that has a hole in it. So how did this, um, uh, how, how, how did this uh, hole get into this rock? He says, who put this hole in the rock? And the people around them said, no, you see the water dripping from, from there. So it dripped over time onto this rock and it ended up making this hole in, in the rock. Uh, it ended up eroding the rock in that way. So um, Rabbi Kiva res- um, r- said to himself at that moment, he said, if that is what water is able to do to a rock, so then Torah, that's Nechshav Kibarzel, Torah, that's like iron, that's like steel, like iron, um, definitely should be able to penetrate my heart that's basar vidam, that's just flesh and blood. That if that's what water is able to do to a rock, imagine what Torah, which is nafshav kibarzel, that's like steel, that's hard like steel, is able to do to my heart. So that's a perfect example. Rabbi Kiva saw water dripping on a rock. And what did he do? He said that there's a lesson to be learned here. He saw beyond just what was happening in front of him, but he saw the potential contained in that situation to be a life lesson. That's a, it's a life-changing lesson. The second example of this, we find in the Gemara in Makos. At the end of Gemara in Makos, the Gemara tells a story that perhaps you're familiar with when Rabbi Kiva is walking with his colleagues by the place of the Makom Hamikdash, the place where the Beis Hamikdash had once stood, that now was, uh, that now was, was destroyed. And the Gemara says, That one time Rabbi Kiva and his colleagues went up to Yerushalayim. Kivan she'egila hartsofim, karu bigdam. When they got to hartsofim, they tore kriya, they tore their garments. Kivan she'egila harabayis. When they get, when came to the Temple Mount, ra'u shual. They saw a fox. She yatsim a base kadshiach kadashin that came out from the Holy of Holies, a place that only the Kohen Gadol was able to go on Yom Kippur, the holiest place in the entire world. That the place that. Um, a, a, a regular, anyone else is not allowed to go into, punishable by death if they go into the Kodesh Kadashim. And here a fox is just walking around freely by the place of the Kodesh Kadashim. They began to cry. Rabbi Kiva Mitzachek. Rabbi Kiva began to laugh. Why? Amrlo. They say to him, Why are you laughing? Amrlahem. Well, he says back, Well, why are you guys crying? 
He says, what do you mean? They say, what do you mean? Amrulo, they say to him, Makum Shikasabo, Vahazarak, or if you must, the place that the Torah refers to as one that if a regular individual were to go to, they will die. The Achshav Shulim Holchubo, and now a fox is just walking around freely in this place. It's a horrible tragedy. Um, uh, what well, we're not supposed to cry. That's the entire reason why I'm crying. Because the, the Navi uh, Uriah, uh, Uriah Cohen tells us, uh, um, uh, what was the 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 um, nevua of Uria? Uh, Uria the Mikdash Rishon. Uria was during the times of the first Temple period, um, uh, and the the Navi tells us that. Uh, um, uh, that uh, Yerushalayim is going to be destroyed, and that by Zechariah during the second temple period, Ksiv, od yishvu zekenim v'zekenot v'rechov Yerushalayim. That the great um, scholars, um, uh, the the righteous men and women, are going to gather once again into the streets of Yerushalayim to um, uh, um, uh, um, to learn there once again. That until we saw the Nevua, the prophecy of Uria come true, one could have doubted whether or not the Nevua of Zechariah is going to come true. I was nervous that the Nevua of Zechariah would not necessarily come true, that Yushalayim is going to once again um, uh, um, give birth to great Torah scholars and people studying the rebuilding of the temple. Now that the Nevua of Uriah has come true, uh, I know that the Nevu of Zechariah is going to come true. They say to him, That Rabbi Kiva, you've consoled us. Akiva, you've consoled us. Now, this Gemara is, I think, another great example. Rabbi Kiva, he saw a fox walking on the, on the Kodesh Kedashim, and he saw it differently than everyone else because he saw it for what its potential, for that scenario actually means, for what that potential looks like. Yes, that is obviously a tragedy that there's a fox walking on the Temple Mound, but it also means that the Navuas are coming true. And that is something that we're supposed to laugh about, something we're supposed to be excited about. So that is, that's the second, second good example. I will say that in our day and age, we're, we're experiencing this even more than Rabbi Kiva, right? We're, Rabbi Kiva saw the first Navua come true of destruction. We're seeing the second Navua of Zechariah coming true, Mamish coming true, right? That Zekanim is and Zekanos uh, uh, are sitting again in Yerushalayim, like uh, um, Reb Chaim Kanievsky used uh, Reb Yaakov Kamenetsky, uh, was the Rosh Yiv of Torah Vadas, used to say about uh, Reb Shlomo Zaman Orbach, who was one of the previous Gedoli Ador, he was the major postic of Yerushalayim, lived in the Shai Chesed neighborhood in Yerushalayim. Um, he passed away in 1994, Reb Shlomo Zaman Orbach. So Reb Yaakov Kamenetsky used to say that when he davened Shmona Esrei, he doesn't think about Rabbi Shlomo Zalman during the bracha of um, Alat Tzadikim, when, th- when, when davening to God to protect the Tzadikim, but rather he thinks about Rabbi Shlomo Zalman when he davens uh, Yerushalayim Ircha Barach Mem Tashuv, that God should rebuild Yerushalayim because Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Arbach is the representation of how God is clearly rebuilding Yerushalayim. When Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Arbach heard that, he said, the only part of that story that's important it, um, to remember is that he doesn't think about me during Alat Tzadikim. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, uh, um, uh, so we're we're clearly seeing the second will come true. But imagine Rabbi Kiva during that moment, right after the Chorban Habayis, is able to look at the situation like that, mm-hmm. because Rabbi Kiva possessed the ability to see the potential and capitalize on the potential of the moment that's in front of him, of the scenario that's in front of him. And there's another great example of this, which is the Gemara at the end of Masech the Brachos, where the Gemara tells us the story of Rabbi Kiva, uh, Rabbi Kiva's death, his murder, really. Um, uh, Rabbi Kiva is one of the 10 martyrs that we discuss on Rosh Hashanah, uh, Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av. And um, the Gemara tells a story of, of what the scene was like when Rabbi Kiva was, was being murdered. B'Sha'a Shehotziu es Rabbi Kiva lahariga, that at the time that the Romans took Rabbi Kiva to, to kill him, Zman Kriyash Mahaya. It was the time to say the Shema. 
And they were raking his skin with iron rakes. And at that point, he said the Shema, Baha'i Mikabal Allah Omah Shemai. And he accepted upon himself the oath of heaven. That's what one is supposed to do when they say the Shema. Supposed to accept upon themselves the commitment to, to God, his uh the the uh, the Torah and his ways. And that's exactly what Bikiva did at that moment. He said the Shema and was Makabal O Mahl Shemai. Amrlo Talmidav, the students say to Rabikiva, Rabbeinu Ad Khan, they say that they say to him, like you're supposed to really go to this extent. Right, that even in this scenario, you're supposed to be uh, saying the Shema and doing it like you're you're being raked to death. Now's the time for you to be uh, fulfilling the mitzvah of Shema. So he says to them, he says, "Kol yamai ha'isi mitzayer al pasuk zeh." That my entire life, I was nervous I'd never be able to fulfill the following mitzvah. That the mitzvah says, "Bechol nafshecha," we have to love God with all of our soul. What does that mean? Even if they're removing your soul, even if you are being murdered, you have a mitzvah to love God. Amarti. So I said to myself, when's going to be the opportunity for me to be able to fulfill this mitzvah? There's one mitzvah in the Torah I'm never going to be able to fulfill. Rabbi Kiva that didn't sit well with him, that there's a mitzvah in the Torah he's never going to be able to fulfill. And then he says, and now that actually the opportunity to fulfill this mitzvah is in front of me, I'm not going to be able to fulfill the mitzvah. I shouldn't fulfill the mitzvah. Of course I should. So that, that at this moment, he extended the word and until his, his soul left his body. Once again, a, a heroic example from Rabbi Kiva of being able to view the moment, not in its isolated fashion, but seeing the potential contained within it um, for, for greatness. That is how Rabbi Kiva, when he went to yeshiva, he went and became Rabbi Kiva. Now, Tosis is not wrong about anybody else. Anybody can do exactly the same thing as Rabbi Kiva. If we capitalize on the moments that are in front of us, if we capitalize on the moments of we're coming to Shavuos, we capitalize on the moment of Shavuos to connect ourselves with the Torah, we also can become like Rabbi Kiva. We capitalize on every class that we have. Um, uh, and... Uh, um, uh, we actually apply to our lives. I say this to myself also, right? I'm teaching information, but I want to make sure that I'm learning it also and applying it to my life as well. That if we take this approach of Rabbi Kiva, then we also can become great in that way. That is perhaps going back to answer our original question, um, why it is that Rabbi Kiva was able to be the person who, who, who gave over all of the Zohar, that gave over all of that to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Right? That why is Rabbi Kiva the, the, the source really to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who we're celebrating on Lagba Omer? It's because that it was because of this, this notion of Rabbi Kiva being able to see the potential in every single moment that he was that was in front of him, he was able to become as great as he became and then pass that on to his, uh, his student, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, there's, a, there's a Gemara, and with this, we'll, uh, we'll close. There's a Gemara elsewhere in Masech the Brachos. On Daf Yud Zayin Amid Beis, that actually says no. On Daf Yud Zayin Amid Al, that actually says that um, uh, that this is a blessing that Talmidei Chachamim would give one another to possess this quality. Uh, it's a, it's essentially a blessing to be like Rabbi Kiva, although it doesn't use those words, but it's it's like that exactly. That when the when the rabbis left the 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 Beis Hamedrash of Rabbi Ami. Amri la mebe Rabbi Chanina. Some say it was when they left the base manager Rabbi Chanina. Amr le, they'd say to each other, Hachi olamach tira bechayech. Um, uh, that um, uh, you should see the world in your lifetime. Hachi, they would say to each other like this, Olamach tira bechayech. You should see the world in your lifetime. Now, what does that mean? So the the punim, um, uh, the the Panami Eros, the Panami Eros was also, he wrote a book called the uh, Sefer Hafla, which is a commentary on the Gemara, but the Panami Eros is a, uh, he was a, I forget his name right now, but he was a um, uh, late 17th century, early 18th century um, uh, Kabbalist and Posek, um, that uh, he was the, the, one of the Rebbeim of the Chassam Sofer, he's one of the Rebbeim of the Chassam Sofer, um, and the, um, 
the Panami Iro says that what this gemar, what this blessing is, is essentially exactly this. You see the world in your lifetime, meaning that as you're going through your life, right? They're leaving the base manager, so going back into the world. As you go back into the world, look for the potential in every single moment that you find yourself in. That you should find that there's a whole world contained within your lifetime. So Rabbi Kiva was able to see a whole world contained within his lifetime. And every single step in his life, he saw everything that was contained within that. And ultimately how he became perhaps an even greater Torah scholar than, uh, than, than Moshe Rabbeinu. So as we approach uh, Shavuos, uh, and uh, uh, especially on the heels of Lag Ba'omer, we're celebrating Rav Shem Yochai. We celebrate um, Rav Shem uh, um Rebbe, uh, Rabbi Kiva, which is really the two characters that are celebrated on Lag Ba'omer, Rabbi Kiva and Rav Shem Yochai. You have a little bit, we have a little bit now more of an appreciation as who Rabbi Kiva was and what the secret to, to his greatness uh, to his greatness was.